if I close my eyes and think of Fellini, I feel exactly as if he's sitting here right next to me now. His presence was so great and so special. And I hear the sound of his voice, which was a unique voice, very soft and very light and very sweet. I can imagine him whispering into my ear, saying, Charlatina. Well, to me, Fellini represents the sort of the ultimate kind of creativity. He's, he's like a little kid in an enormous, expensive sandbox who's playing. He loved the circus. He loved the clowns. He made a film about clowns. He dreamed about clowns. He defined the cinema as a man uh, with a box cranking a camera with a clown dancing in front of it. And that's a pretty good definition, actually. Well, I think he was very humble about what he did. I think he thought of himself as a storyteller. He certainly started from very humble origins. I mean, you know, cartoons, scribbling uh, drawings for tourists in, in Rome. Uh, and he started uh, as the American occupation of Rome began. He founded a place called the Funny Face Shop on Via Nazionale, actually in Rome. Of course, his major customers were American soldiers who most of the time had no idea what the, the currency in their hand was because they were usually inebriated. Um, <laughs> And, and so they, he said that in, in terms of actual spending power, he made more money doing these caricatures for American soldiers than he ever did for the rest of his life. And the style of Fellini's cartoon drawings is very much indebted to the early American cartoon. To Frederick Burr Opper, who did Happy Hooligan. Uh, he was influenced by Windsor McKay, who did Little Nemo. Uh, he'd begun working for a, a, a Roman um, magazine, sort of the Roman equivalent of Punch called Marc Aurelio, which is Marcus Aurelius. And he was, he was actually incredibly well known as a writer for this, and also as a writer for radio programs on which his, his wife performed. Giulietta Messina was very important in the life of uh, Federico, and he met her when he was writing a radio show called Chico and Paulina. And he heard her voice, and he fell in love with her voice. He called her and said, I would like to take you to dinner, but uh, if you don't go to dinner with me, I'll commit suicide. She was a carefully brought up girl living with her aunt. Her aunt said, you can't go out with someone you don't know. But then she told her aunt about the wonderful restaurant they were going to go to. And uh, her aunt rethought it and she said, well, it's the most expensive restaurant in Rome and nothing bad could happen to you there. So she went. And the only thing was Julietta thought of something bad that could happen to her and that's that he wouldn't have enough money to pay that tremendous check. So she took money along in case he needed help, and she ordered an omelet. So in a strange sort of way, Fellini was well known for everything but films. He was known as a kind of journalist and a, and a sort of clever young man who was supplying gags to people and, and, and jokes and what have you. And this is how he got connected to uh, Rossellini and script writing, because of course the, the star of Rome Open City, Aldo Fabrizi, was a good friend of his. Rossellini went to Fellini to make the introduction. That's the way things happened in Rome in 1940 and 1950. You know, you'd go to the right restaurant, you'd meet the right person. Things were sort of very simple, really. You know, they weren't this complicated sort of world. It's actually a, a kind of an idyllic kind of world in a way. Nobody probably then realized how creative they were all being. They just thought it was normal work. Fellini was very much involved with writing some of the most important neorealist films. He wrote scripts for Rome Open City, he wrote scripts for Paisan, and a whole series of things with Rossellini, but also Without Pity by La Toada, and a series of other films that all are, are made in this period, in the 40s and the 50s. Fellini's directing is, is I think, in, in pretty much a direction away from neorealism, absolutely. I mean, by the time you get to eight and a half, you're talking about interior stage. You're not talking about reality at all. You're talking about fantasy and illusion and dreams and nightmares and, and uh, uh, wish fulfillments, all visualized. And that's really what Fellini is about. He begins with this sort of tradition, but he goes away from it very quickly. In fact, in La Strada, he's accused by the Italian Marxists of being betraying neorealism. The White Sheik is a very striking picture, and even more after you know the body of work of Federico Fellini, because the White Sheik was his first experience directing a film. And uh, he felt the most important thing he had to display was total confidence for everyone, because otherwise they would all fall apart. 
and not believe in their director. Yet he was really shaking and couldn't sleep and in misery because it was so much what he wanted to do. I couldn't share my self-doubts with anyone, even Julietta, although I couldn't totally hide my nervousness from her. When I left home for the first day of shooting, she stood in the doorway to kiss me goodbye. It was not a token kiss, but one given with the passion before a departure on an adventure from which I might never return. I felt like the moment in battle when you first come into direct contact with the enemy. Where could I go if I failed? I would have to leave Rome. For me, that would have been a fate worse than death. The first day, if I'm not mistaken, he walks around, you know, mm. looking very, you know, very wise and puzzled. The second day, he finally realizes that he's stuck now because the producer's going to fire him if he doesn't get going. And so, and the scene is very difficult. It's, it, the scene is the one where the white sheik is trying to get Wanda on the boat to go out into the ocean. And of course, you know, shooting a boat on an ocean is not that easy. I mean, the cameras, the cameras they had then were not handheld cameras. It's a big deal. You know. So supposedly, according to Fellini, again, he, tell, he asks himself, well, what would Rossellini do? And, and he has the brilliant idea to put the boat on the beach and shoot through backwards, you know, into the ocean as if you're on the water. No problem, right? Actually, it's, it's perfect. If you look at the film, unless somebody tells you, look at the ocean, which way the, the water is moving. I mean, if you look, you'll see the waves are coming in, right? They can't possibly come in on the boat. If you look at it carefully, you'll see that. But actually, he was right, you know? He was absolutely right. And after that, he said, he was always in command. He was nervous about meeting people and doing things. And he had this belief that a man has to always be confident and never show any kind of weakness. And actually, he had this reputation, which he knew about, for coming late, for being undependable, for not showing up, whatever. I don't know why he had that reputation. For me, he always came early. He always kept his word. There's a picture with Federico and with me, which was taken the morning after the Oscars. Federico has his hand raised, which was a kind of gesture that he often did with me. And it was a picture of himself that he sometimes put on his letters as his signature. And he would write, I swear. And that meant that he was really going to do it, that he really meant it, that I could depend on him. The White Sheik is a very interesting film because it's based on a phenomenon that, that uh, a photo romanza, which is a photo novel. There are basically still real, still pictures of real people with the, 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 the fumetti or the comic, the, the word in Italian is fumetti for comic strip, the little bubbles that you have the dialogue in. The script is, is actually was, was partially scripted by Michelangelo Antonioni, which is sort of interesting. He sort of suggested the idea. It's really all about a kind of uh, second-rate Valentino character. I mean, the white sheik is obviously a kind of reference to Rudolph Valentino. But of course, uh, the, the character played by Alberto Sordi in the film is a sort of tawdry, second-rate uh, loser, basically. And that's the kind of people that Fellini liked, in, in a way. He didn't like these. He wouldn't have liked a real Valentino. What he liked was someone who was clearly not a Valentino, who thought he was and pretended to be. Oh, bonjour. He always liked people who had been on the stage and who had had the experience as Sorty did because he used to perform before the movies. He thought those actors were especially ahead in what they did. But he didn't always choose professional actors and he liked kind of innocent actors, innocent people. And he had thousands of pictures, thousands of photographs submitted by people from all over Italy. And he would pick out a face. It was an example of what he did with Leopoldo Trieste and the White Sheik when he saw a face and the big eyes that he thought would be perfect. So he took a writer and made him an actor. Ivan, uh, the, the, the male protagonist in the film, um, is of course this provincial husband who comes to Rome with his bride on a honeymoon. He believes in obeying all the rules, all the regulations, uh, never doing anything unusual, never doing anything spontaneous. Of course, his wife is the one that has this love affair with this, this silly sheik that he, she's, she's read about in the, the Fotoromancia in these cartoons. And she's the one who's the sort of emotional 
a uh, person who closes her eyes when she kisses. And what happens in the film is they, they get lost and they go two separate ways and, and the film goes back and forth between these two characters. She sort of transfers her dream life to him and he sort of uh, hides his peccadilloes as, as, he, as he goes maneuvers through the city, including having a tryst with a prostitute. And so the, this idea of a mask that, that you're, you have the social mask that you wear in public, but in private you're something quite different. And very often the drama in these films is that whatever sort of event occurs that forces you to rip that mask off and reveals what you really are underneath. And then I think all his early films are about that really about people revealing what their true nature is. Julietta was very acclaimed theater actress of the moment, but she had her troubles being in films because she wasn't a typical ingenue. She was very individual and not exactly what producers could imagine. And even though she was very young when she began, 1920, uh, she didn't photograph as young. And so they were always concerned and always objecting and always kind of hard on Julietta. But he gave her this part as the good-hearted prostitute, one of them, who uh, is consoling to the hero in the film. And she was called Kabiria. <laughs> Fellini once said, very humorously, but I think actually true, that he was born married. And by that I think he meant that he was, he had the perfect wife for him. I mean, Giulietta Messina was a, a, a muse in a way. She was a, a, the actress in some of his greatest films. She also, I think, was smart enough to understand that someone like Fellini is eccentric and weird and is not somebody that's going to follow the rules and is not someone that's going to come home at five o'clock and read the newspaper. I mean, she was you know, the perfect wife in that sense as well. And of course, she was the perfect wife in, because she was also long-suffering. She was not perfectly happy because she felt her husband was unfaithful to her. He was, but he said not in his heart. He was always faithful in his heart. And he said, what did a little dalliance matter? Well, it mattered to her. <laughs> but she forgave him. And she felt he would never leave her because, as she told me, she had her secret spaghetti sauce recipe. And he loved the spaghetti with the sauce. She never gave the recipe to anyone, but she gave it to me. She would say Federico could find another woman, but he could never find another spaghetti sauce. They had a very, very long, I mean, they were married forever, I mean, until, until he died and then she died shortly thereafter. And they say it was cancer, but I, you know, the romantic explanation is a broken heart. The White Sheik was a, did very badly at the box office, so it was, it was very close to ending Fellini's career. But luckily, the next film he made um, was the first film to be shown abroad. It won, the, it won an award at the Venice Film Festival. It was very popular abroad. In many ways, uh, Fellini was, I think, almost recognized abroad even before he was recognized at home. So with his fourth film, La Strada, which was an international super hit, then he was really launched. And then after that, The Knights of Gabiria, and then Eight and a Half, I mean, that's, Eight and a Half is a career for anybody, just that film alone. And I don't think Fellini even thought of himself as an artist. I think that became, it became obvious at a certain point, even to him, you know, that if you've won five Oscars and I don't know how many other awards, and you, 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 the La Dolce Vita changes sort of the, the way people thought about cinema in the 60s, and, and you know, you've broken all European box records and whatever. At a certain point, you know, you have to recognize that you're successful. Martin Scorsese and Woody Allen and, you know, Peter Greenway and, gee, I don't know, just the list is uh, Bob Fosse, particularly. All sorts of people have been influenced by Fellini. Almost every Filmmaker in film school goes through a Fellini stage, I'm sure, where they do a film about dreams or something. It's quite, it's a, and it's quite a career for a little guy from a very small town in uh, provincial Italy, actually. I approached The White Sheik with great trepidation, though in retrospect, its filming seems tranquil compared to what I would face on and off the sets 
of my following pictures. At the time, I didn't know what the future held. I have never been good at looking to the future. I am not even good at looking into the present. <laughs>